Hey, let's start the show. Oh, that's too low. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Ready? You ready? Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, January 16th, 2020, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. Dot com. Right. <laughs> Look at that fucking squirrel on my bird feeder. And then suddenly, the Enterprise D's bridge. Hello and welcome to, well, a special episode of This Is Only A Test, because you heard from the intro, we got an OG in the house, Will Smith. What was what, 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 that special? That was like my dearest, you know, it's like a comma there. What does that comma mean, Norm? The comma means well, it's special. A special, I guess. <laughs> it's a, was, was that a Hamilton reference? Yeah, it, it was. was. That's nice, dude. Yeah. Uh, it's good to be here, Norm. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. <laughs> sure wasn't available. And uh, <laughs> and we didn't record an episode of Still Entitled this week, so let's get all your opinions oh, yeah. and thoughts here. Well, you had Mark yeah. Rober on. This we, week. we did also. Ooh. That was episode recorded last week. So a little bit of nice. sausage making, uh, and we didn't record this week because we had the unfortunate timing of the passing of Adam's dog Huxley. Oh, yeah. So it just was not good timing for all. Jeremy's here as well. Which Hello, is great fellas. Also special. Oh, it's great to have Jeremy here, I see. <laughs> you know, Will, uh, you missed a uh, you missed two episodes of this podcast where the outro, the fake outro mm -hmm. that we do, I'm going back to the end. So yeah. if you don't listen all the way to the end of this podcast, what you may miss is that at the end of the episode, we end each episode with an outro created by one of you. And... Uh, these are posted on the forums. There is actually a SoundCloud link where you can download the raw asset that then you remix, uh, if you so choose, or did, put in whatever did, effect. Did you just tell people to check out your SoundCloud? You can check out our SoundCloud. Okay. We're going viral. Uh, and and create a, an outro that will play. We don't even listen to them beforehand. They could be obscene. Oh, this is a they could be idea. all sorts, but but they've been fantastic so far. We've had a bunch of standout contributors, uh, Justin, aka Speed, Wohawk, Wohawk. and uh, of late, Wohawk's been really killing it. And the last two episodes of this ep podcast, we used an outro created by him that called back to one of the great moments of this podcast. It was CES. 2013. Do you remember CES 2013, Will? Spoiler, uh, you weren't there. That was the year, yeah, that was when my daughter was born. That's right. Yeah. And do you remember what you did the year your daughter I was born? I did an angry rant about how much CES sucks. Yes. And do you know what still sucks? CES. CES. The Concept Electronic Show. Um, Actually, this year, something that was useful got announced. The Bluetooth low energy audio spec. That's, that's you know, that's on our show notes, Will, to oh. be discussed in the technology news what discussion. What a perfect segue. <laughs> um, a segue to the middle of the show. Uh, anyway, that's a, a, a call out for you out there. I should do if, rants. If you want to. Yes. Oh, you know, Jeremy had a whole segment where he did rants and people loved it. I know. I think he, he, he caught one of them. I was here. I you was here, here for multiples. For, it was the 500 episode. I did one on that with Gary and Will. Mm. That's right. I, okay. Well, you did one on a previous episode that was a real, it was a real incisive, like you really got in and got like, you, you really let us know what ground your gears. I don't feel passionately about much. Yeah. But when it comes to backing in the parking spaces, I'm all in. You know, there was an article about this in the New York Times this week. About parking space backers. Maybe it was Mel. I can't remember. Something I read on the internet regularly. Really? And uh, it turns out that that is a very divisive thing. Like people are either 100% <laughs> oh? no. for backing into parking spaces or they're against backing into parking spaces. What is there a name for these two groups that identify? What do you self-identify as, Jeremy? Are you, you're a, you're a back inner. You know, I, wait, do you back in or, or do you not a back in? Or? He, he backs I've, in. I've, I've been backing in since before I had a backup camera. And oh, the backup wow. camera, Bold there's choice. no excuse. You should be doing this kind of thing. It's a smart move. You think it's safer? It is far safer when you're leaving the parking space because you can see what you're about to hit hmm. or whatnot. You're backing out of the parking space. It's so, you, when you pull into a parking space forward, you're just, you're thinking about the now. You're not thinking about the future. And that's the problem. Yeah. And We're when, Americans, Jeremy. But when you do back into a spot, you can see better then and you can see better later. So I don't ever back into spaces in parking lots, but I always back into the driveway because you want to, when you're pulling out of the driveway, 
always want to be nose first. You don't want to back out into the street. That's true. Depends how long of a nose you have too. Well, that's true. I used to live in an apartment. That apartment I lived in on uh, across from Costco, south of Market. The only way I could fit into the parking space was to back in. So I had to back off of Harrison Street, which is a really busy four lane road where people go 90 miles an hour. And it was always terrifying. And I, I'm a little shell shocked. You it, say it's a divisive thing, but I don't think it would be if we were all on the same capability level. If, <laughs> whoa. We, if we could if we all, if we all practiced it. It or is not an easy thing. Driving backwards is not an easy no. thing. I, although I watched a semi drive backwards down Chenery Street the other day. That's pretty amazing. For three blocks. That's a narrow. Wow, street. really? It <laughs> yeah. seems like it should be against the rules. Past two stoplights. Or stop, stop signs. It was impressive. Hauling? Yes. Is Chenery? Because he missed his turn. <laughs> Well, yeah, and where the hell is he going to turn around on Chenery? That guy blows me away. Like, I can't back up like that guy. I used to get, like, when I had a boat, and I would be responsible for backing the boat down the boat ramp. Yeah. When there's always an audience, and you're like, you know, like, you know that there's a bunch of old guys with mustaches drinking a can of cores, club cores, that are, like, there to judge you. Well, mm -hmm. towing and backing up is a completely different story, too. Well, backing up, because everything's yeah. backwards, backwards. Yeah. 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 Like, left is right, and right is left. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That's basically what the semi is. Uh, right. And uh, not enough, I think, is it BMW and Audi that have the patent to do the, uh, the composite Skycam, the, the warped image where you can oh. see, you can get a, essentially a drone's eye view of your car. I have that. With, yeah, Jeremy's car does that. Oh, you have that as well? Yeah. yeah. 360, man. See, th that makes backing up a no-brainer. Yep. Can you trust that thing? Yes. It's 100%? It's amazing. What if there's like a dog between you and the curb? Does it show up on the camera? Yes, it's okay. warped. It doesn't look like a dog, but you see it's okay. a furry thing. You can see the lines importantly. <laughs> it looks right? like it's been splurged. How, how close the lines are to your left and right side as it you're blows people. In. People don't know how they do it. They get in my car. They're like, how is that? How is that your car? And then I have to tell them, I don't have a white car. It's a white car on the screen. <laughs> Why is it a white car on the you screen? You guys. Because it can be any color you car. Get your, you get your color car on your screen. Yes. Uh, I just, it lines all bolts are a white car but then i say put your hand out the window yeah and they do and then their hand like takes up an entire quarter of, <laughs> of the car there's this massive hand out there they're should, like oh look i'm gonna give you what you should do is hit the hazard lights button and be like i'm launching the drone and then put it in reverse yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah i like that mm -hmm. yeah anyway how were your past weekends you guys do anything fun this week fine no fine no Watch movies, TV shows. You know what I'm doing? I'm, I'm catching up on, I'm re actually I'm watching for the first time, The West Wing. Yeah. It's, it's a fantastic a TV show. It's a lot of television. It's seven seasons of 22 no, episodes each. It's like five seasons. Well, Aaron Sorkin did it for four, I believe. And, and then, then they, when he left, they did I think a it was couple only, more seasons. I Jeremy's looking more. up right now. Seven seasons. Seven wow. seasons. That's what Netflix says. I only made it's it on, to five. on Netflix. Uh, now... It's Danica's favorite show of all time. Okay. She's seen the entire show dozens of times, entire run of the show dozens of times, in, in some episodes, maybe hundreds. Uh, and so she knows it by heart. You're right. He only directed or writ, wrote the first four. First four yeah, seasons. Yeah. And then he, he left. Uh, I'm coming into it in a, from a peculiar place because I remember catching episodes here and there in the final season when it was first airing. I know it's not how you're, it's not no. an ideal way to do it, but I'm going to make a case for something. Did here. they make, did, did Rob Lowe was the only one who left early aside from. I don't know that. Okay. Well, you know who was in the last few episodes. That's the thing. Oh, you don't? Because you don't have I any don't, connection I with those characters. I have no connection. So I'm making a wow. case right now that it, maybe not the finale finale, because things may happen, but there could be a case to watching like the penultimate episode of a good show. Maybe really? not Game of Thrones, but like if you watch an episode from the final you season. You said a good show, Norm. Oh, fine. <laughs> Star Trek Next Generation. Uh -huh. okay. If you watch the penultimate episode of Star Trek Next Generation. By the way, do you know what episode that was? Just curious. Yeah, it was the, the first part of the finale. Yeah, was, <laughs> that's not fair. You didn't mean that. <laughs> I right? did not okay. mean that. I actually don't know what, okay. what, what, uh, curious. Okay. what episode that is. But then if it's like a, if it's a serialized story, yeah. like, like the West, yeah. it, it's coming to a conclusion. And if it's presumably a lot of returning cast, watch that and then go back to the beginning. Let's say Boardwalk Empire. Watch the penultimate, penultimate episodes, the second last episode of Boardwalk Empire, mm -hmm. and then go back and rewatch the series. It's kind of like a flashback. You make the entire series a flashback. I doubt that by the time you get to the end, you catch up, you will have one remembered 
the plot details, but I do like the idea that the the filling in the gaps. It's almost happens like as you're watching. It's mm. almost like you're building in a show mechanic. Like if the first episode were the last episode, yes. the penultimate episode. Yeah. And then Mad Men. Here's that's another How episode. I Met Your Mother, you know. Yes, if you How I Met Your Mother and Mad Men, would that work? Huh. Uh, Cuz I'm doing it right now with the West Wing and I find that it is working. If you How I Met Your Mother and Mad Men, it would because the real the real moment for that is the Hershey's episode. Like that show, the pivot on that which that show turns is when he has the breakdown in the Hershey's episode. I also like that if you do it this way, sure, if you, if you have good memory and you watch an episode and you kind of under, you see, okay, this thing happens here. These two people are having this fight or this, they are in this place in their lives, but you have no context for it because you've never seen the series and you rewatch it. You get to experience, you get to have this experience of, 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 of watching something from completely two different perspectives. It's like having this memory drop, drop in so, so the, I mean, the thing about West Wing, though, is it's less it, like more so than even most like we, you know, network dramas, hour long network dramas of that time. It is less about plot than it is about especially the overarching story is less about plot than it is about the characters. Hmm. Like if you think about it in that, like CJ is essentially the same character through the entire run of that show. Right. Like she changes, obviously, and she becomes a more vocal part of that of that cast and that administration. But like. The character is more or less the same, right? And and I think it's because those characters were drawn really well that you can kind of like, it is a show that if it's on, I will kind of pick it up and watch it, watch, and it doesn't matter where it is because I'm like, okay, this is after that thing happened and before the election and after John Goodman, but before this. And and like, you know where you are, but it kind of doesn't matter, which is I think one of the things Danica likes. And also, and also it. it's, it's something that uh, network television is good for, for yeah. syndication, because, yeah. you know, these shows are forever in perpetuity being rebroadcast somewhere, and they want people to be able to jump in and watch an episode, not feel like they have to do the Netflix binging thing. So Alice, Alice and Janie, CJ Craig went to yes. my college. Really? Yes, we're, we're very proud of her. She, you should be. She's oh, you, a fantastic is, actress. Is your college more actress. proud of her than Ted from How I Met Your Mother? <laughs> exactly. Did we're, he go there too? He did. We're equally proud of both. We are, no. We are, more proud, we are more proud of Paul Newman. Wow. Did you go to Kent okay. State? Kent State, no. no. No, went to Kenyon. Kenyon. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> um, Interesting. There's an episode to, have you started season three? I have. So you've seen I've seen the 9-11, the 9/11 the, which is a phenom- like a weird that came out of, That came out of nowhere. I mean, that was yeah. less than a month after 9-11. And, well, and, and I remember that hitting home for me in a way that no news broadcast did. Let's, let's discuss that just a little bit. The context here is uh, the s- season finale of season two of The West Wing is a big cliffhanger. It's an episode called Two Cathedrals, and it is widely regarded as one of the best hours of television, at least on network TV, before there was prestige TV, because it was a culmination of There this, was prestige TV then. That was post-Sopranos, sure, it was post, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was two, 2000, you know, spring yeah. of 2000. And it, had, it was a culmination of this uh, drama, of this plot that had been brewing for the whole, that started off with a cliffhanger in the beginning of season two with the, the, uh, the, uh, the attack. And then at the end of this press conference cliffhanger and everyone's bracing for it and a whole summer went by. And of course, 9-11 happened in 2001 mm. and they couldn't jump into West Wing, a show about the White House, about politics and not have a way to address it. Right. So the way they did that was wrote in three weeks, a bottle episode that while it takes place in the universe of the West Wing with some of the characters, it does not exist in the continuity of the show. Is that true? Oh, that really? True. Wow. It does not, like, if you say, where does that episode fit in? Is it in the middle of season three? What has is it be, beginning of season, yeah. middle of season two? Yeah. It doesn't. It's not a canonical story point. It they, is they just don't carry a, any threads of the rest of the show. It is a, just a standalone play almost. Huh. Mm-hmm. With the 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 tone and universe one. of 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 the West Wing, and I remember but inconsequential in terms of the plot. Most of it does take place in a single room. Yeah, it's yeah. A bottle episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they did that as the premiere, and I believe the actors then did a like an intro, like this is what you're watching. This is our way of addressing what's happened in the real world because a TV show, you know, that's already been written can't can't really respond that quickly. Um, and then they carry on, and the Next episode is Manchester Part One, which is a direct continuation of the cliffhanger yeah. at the end of season two. 
They, they that show had a series of really good cliffhanger endings for the most part. Like the the season finales were always really good. The thing that amazes me about it is they did twenty four episodes a season, twenty three episodes a season, and they're well, so there's no the show twenty four and Star Trek Next Generation. But the show twenty four, there's there's some filler. Yes. Star Trek Next Generation. Lots of filler. Lots of filler. <laughs> the entire four episode arcs of filler. You know, with with on West Wing, even the episodes that are kind of like the gimmicky capsule episodes, like um, Big Block of Cheese, right? Big Block of Cheese. Big Block of Cheese Day. Doesn't fit into the continuity. Like you don't need nothing. Nothing happens there that goes forward other than character development. But it's an opportunity for them to have fun and like have the people who want to get rid of the pennies come in or have the people who want to get rid of. I can't remember. Mercator what maps. Yeah, exactly. Mercator maps. The, the, and then and then it gave them an opportunity to callbacks later in that season and even in future seasons about the, the map people and the and the the tyranny of the middle attitudes. And <laughs> like it's 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 just such a it's it's brilliant. It's really a it lovely show. Truly brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Also a show that, you know, not to touch too much on the modern day political climate it could not exist today. You know, House of Cards in many ways felt like a response to the optimism of the West Wing. And so much of the West Wing is from the, you know, yes, from the mind of Aaron Sorkin, but is a liberal fantasy. Well, now, now, I mean, you could do that. You'd make the conservative fantasy and I'm not going to say anything because I don't want YouTube to yell at me more than they already do. It's an idea. Yeah. <laughs> I think we are. <laughs> yeah, that's the right answer. story this week. You know, CES is over. We're going to move on to entertainment as our top story. We had the Oscar nominations this Monday. They were, and this comes on the heels of the uh, Golden Globe Awards mm -hmm. the week before, uh, which as a precursor of the Oscar is, pretends to give us some clues as to who might be in the running. Uh, a few surprises here. Um, have you guys watched the movies? I've watched a surprising number of them for me, which is to say, you know, probably half as many as you. Um, I've watched more of them than I would usually have by this yeah. point. Yeah. Let's start with, uh, let's go in order of, of uh, as, as they would broadcast us. Let's, let's go with the, some of the categories that are not as well known. Let's start with best animated film. Okay. Because Wait, a surprise well, for animation, best, Norm. I've yeah, never heard of this before. <laughs> One of the... Uh, in terms of best animated film, a surprise was that Frozen 2 was not nominated. Yeah, it's now the most popular animated film ever if you don't count Lion King. Okay, if you Which don't count the new Lion King. Lion King? If you, what do you mean if you don't count the Lion new King? one that came out last year? The live action. Uh, the, yeah, the, the one that looks like live action. Did that make isn't. more money yes. than, than Frozen 2? But that's what? the only animated film that ever has. And Disney actually puts them in different categories. So they consider Frozen 2 to be the most uh, lucrative. Uh, film they've ever made. Yeah, the that new Lion, the Favreau Lion King seems like a live action remake of Lion King. That's not, what they consider. Yeah, but Even it is one hundred percent. Well, no, there's one. There's one scene. Oh, is that right? Yeah, he left one shot, and then it's just real Savannah. It's the opening. It's like tell. it's like the third shot in the film. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's in the immediate. Opening. I'm waiting for Disney Plus. Um, it to come to Disney Plus. I, I like a lot of these movies. I haven't seen Klaus. That's a Netflix Santa movie. Yeah, two D animation. Oh, really? By like computer-assisted hand-drawn? I, I believe so. Neat. Um, I didn't like How to Train Your Dragon 3 particularly. What happened in that one? I <laughs> I think that the black dragon met a white dragon. I don't know. I, fell asleep. That, I that almost fell last, asleep in the movie theater. Last year? Wow, all right. I went to see it with my daughter, and I was like yeah. snoozing mm -hmm. DreamWorks, man. Is that is that a franchise that was hurt by the fact that they created so many, uh, the, the TV series, and right. it wasn't it didn't feel like a long-awaited return to that world? That's just the way DreamWorks works now. Like, they, there's been a Trolls TV show. There's been a Boss Baby TV hey, show. Hey, you say that, but I'm looking forward to the new Trolls movie a Trolls lot. Trolls Old Tour, I'm there, man. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll day one that with all you. All right, right, good. Hey, the, yeah, the back are, boys are in it. Are you going to be a metal troll, or are you going to be a punk troll? Oh, I'm all about the hip-hop you, troll. You're a hip-hop troll? Yeah. Uh, see, I'm a, I'm a pop Pop troll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other uh, nominations for animated film, and now this is the only category we'll go real deep into uh, because it's of interest to us. Uh, I lost my body, which is. A, a, Wait, what are you talking about? I, I've, I've never heard of this film. What I, I lost animated film. Ah. Uh, it is. It's French. It, film synopsis, synopsis, adventure, young love, and childhood memories intertwine as a severed hand crosses Paris in search of its owner. So it's Thing from the Addams Family, also yes. not nominated. Yeah. Now, 
to- uh, Pixar Toy- usually walks away with the Oscar. Mm-hmm. I'll, I wouldn't be surprised if Toy Story wins it, but Missing Link won the Golden Globe. That's I correct. thought Missing Link was fabulous. I, we watched it a few times, and it is a lovely, charming film with really good performances by, uh, surprisingly, Zach Galifianakis. Hugh Jackman? Hugh Jackman. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, stop, it's stop motion. Stop. It's, 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 as stop it's the motion, like a thing that they do now. As, yeah. Yes. And, and it, it incorporates a lot of 3D printing to do the facial Mm-hmm. Uh, animation. But then they also do like computer animation for backgrounds and effects and all that stuff right, on top right, of the stop motion. Right, and those run at like full frame rate. Sometimes. Yeah, it's super cool. Yeah, it's really, it's a lovely, it's a lovely film and like the sets, I constantly was watching that wondering, oh man, how did they do this shot? Really? I, it's a, like a film school. I always, yeah, I, I have not seen all. it all. I mean, the last one they did was Kubo, I believe. Kubo, which I loved. And, and they had the biggest stop motion puppet they made for that one, one of the big, the villains. Yeah, the big warrior. Uh-huh. And for this one, they had incredible uh, walking on elephants set oh, hmm. God, and the behind that, the scenes for oh. that just shows like this. Do they know, do an end at the end of the film where they show you a little brief how not, they did it? The best one they've done that was Box Trolls. Okay. Do you remember Box yeah, Trolls? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Loved it because the, and the end credits for Box Trolls they had two of the characters, the villains, the kind of like your um, like your your, your uh, the, the, the thugs, the sidekicks. They were had this conversation with each other. And it, it was an existential conversation. Yeah. And as they were having that conversation, they would pan out and then inc- incorporate the uh, time lapse blurring of the animators. And so you could see the, the characters being animated in, in that time That's lapse. That's awesome. Um, as well I, as the set. So the thing I liked about Missing Link also is, and this doesn't necessarily help it for Oscars, but like Kubo, definitely not a kid, a movie for young kids. Uh, Missing Link is a very, very much a young kid safe movie. Like it's mm. not, it, it is scary in the ways that are good for children. Not necessarily, this isn't necessarily a stop motion movie made for adults. So it's, you said Toy Story 4 is also nominated. Yeah. Um, the yeah. other one, here, Missing Link, and then... Klaus. Klaus, there's one more. Uh, Klaus, the hand Klaus, one, body, that's dragon. It. That's it. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's the five. five. Yeah. Yeah. Is this like his last movie, Missing Link? It's their most recent. They, yeah, but they keep breaking up. <laughs> like, what, really? Uh, yeah, I feel like, like they just keep, they can't do it. Like the money's just not there. This movie did not make a lot of money. And I, I hope that Missing Link wins to galvanize the whoever's behind. Yeah. And uh, to uh, like a, to fund another movie and they, for them to get distribution. I think same with um, Aardman, their last movie, Early Man, didn't, make, didn't mm-hmm. make a ton of money either. And it's really sad because both of those are beautiful labors of love for animation. Stop motion, for sure. Uh, let's talk about best movie, because there are... Well, but before we get there, can I just make a point? Yes. Um, I was looking at a couple of more technical awards for the, for sound. Sound mixing and sound editing, Okay, they're the same movies, except for one. Like, four of the movies are the exact, are in that, are in both categories. Except there's... And it's just like, what, maybe that shouldn't be two different categories, <laughs> You know, well, but so, it's two different things. Is it? But sound, it really, like, who is watching a film saying that mixing is good, but the editing's not? <laughs> well, so it's like it's like um, uh, one is a one is a yeah. I see what you're saying. But I think like, we are not educated enough yeah, to I, differentiate. I'm always hesitant to say, hey, this is this thing that I know nothing about Look, is. We we love films, and and I wouldn't be surprised if there are mem- many members of the academy who have no experience with sound mixing, sound editing, and don't even you know don't have enough. But for some of the technical awards, they have mm-hmm. to be voted on by only people, by the people, people in that in, practice. In, in, is yes. that true for these? I know for like visual effects, it is. Okay, yeah. I do believe. Uh, like, I mean, you could make the argument that some people may not know the difference between visual effects and cinematography. Or some or people, directing and well, deep, and DP. That's, yeah, it's, it's going a little far, Norm. I mean, what about music original score versus music original song? Uh, see, I know, but I know the difference. See, you know the difference. I know the difference. <laughs> because but you have really, songs. I mean, I, I honestly think there's a lot of mixing probably going on in the editing. And it's just, it's a hard thing to, to differentiate between. And it's so, odd that both of these well, categories have the exact same movie. Well, sounds like we need to find a sound editor and great. a sound mixer and Fine. have them in conversation with each other talking about their jobs. Yeah, I mean, I feel like they probably do the edit and then they mix the edit, result of the edit. You use right? Premiere. <laughs> Come on. Norm's already there. <laughs> God, we're going to uh, get yelled at so much I'm, on this. <laughs> Jeremy Williams, uh, I, everyone. I, 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 I welcome it. I welcome the dialogue. Uh, but if you want to know the, the four films that are crossover, it is uh, Ford versus Ferrari. It is Joker. So, 1917. Okay. You don't want to know the last yes, one? Yes, I do want to know And the last Once one. Upon a Time in Hollywood. So Ad Astra and Rise of Skywalker got the two space yeah, slots. Those are the weird ones. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. You, now, I will... I will explain in one sentence. Oh, good. The difference. Okay. All right. 
because there are, there are articles about this. You are not the only person who has thought this idea. Well, it's just there's, that there's, there's so, no such thing as an original thought it's just in 2020. S- they're the same movies. That's, that's all. Now, I'm you saying. notice in sound editing, the, one of the movies that's not in sound mixing is Rise of Skywalker. Right. Right. And in Rise of Skywalker... I did think that the sound mix was what ruined that movie for me. <laughs> The sound editing was much superior. Has the pew pews. Yeah. Yeah. Pew pew. Has the room. Has the, right. Yeah. Because sound editing mm-hmm. is the job of collecting the sounds needed. Oh. So it's not properly, it's not maybe best named. So the sound film ed- editor edits the audio, yeah. but the sound editor. No, 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 no. Sound editor is are like the people who create the sound effects. They're the Foley people. The Foley people. Sound editing is about collecting the sounds needed. Oh. Sound mixing is what's done with the sounds after. Oh, that's what I consider editing. Yes. Interesting. So so that person has no agency is what I'm hearing. They just get to move the sounds around. Pew, pew. So maybe the best way to think about it, it's the editorial for sound. Mm. Okay. Sound editing is creating the editorial, creating the soundscapes, and then the mixing is is what you do with those effects. Now we all learned something We did all. Thank you. Learn something. Oh, there was a the sound editing category used to be called sound effect at editing. Oh. And sound effect editing may be a more appropriate name. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just so. Well, today we're all I learned. It's TIL. Yeah. Uh, best picture of the year. I want to do visual effects. Too. I think it's got to be Joker. Oh, okay, so visual effects. Because that's oh. when I, uh, you know, we can talk about it. Yeah. So we got Avengers Endgame, The Irishman, mm-hmm. The Lion King, 1917, and Rise of Skywalker. Now, I haven't had 18 hours to watch The Irishman yet. Yeah, I did watch it. Really? Yeah, it took me like four, like three, three, four days. Four sittings, but I, yeah. I made it through. Okay. And if you actually, Netflix also has a documentary you can watch about the visual effects in that film. And that's worth seeing because that's, it actually is very impressive what they managed to do. It's not just the de aging. It, it is the de aging, but Scorsese refused to shoot with ping pongs on their face. Right? Oh. So oh. what they did was they came up, ILM came up with a brand new method of, of, uh, Capturing per- capture. performance, yeah, performance with, capture. from a third person camera that's not mounted to the, to the to the actor, and they did that by incorporating two infrared cameras that are shoot, um, on the side, looking at the eyes laterally mm. to the main film camera, and so they shoot and they capture depth and no shadows, and then they can create three D geometry from that. <laughs> And then apply that to the film. This sounds like an awful lot of work because Pacino or De Niro did not want to put on ping pongs, ping pongs, yeah. <laughs> and wear that head rig, which is I can see their that. prerogative, absolutely, right? You, that that maybe inhibit their acting, but that's also part of the acting. I think they're too old to have new tricks added to their acting at this point. I don't think that's Scorsese's jam. Yeah. So I, I mean, it's, it's cool. not cinema. It's cool. <laughs> ping pongs on face <laughs> are not cinema. Yeah. No, definitely <laughs> as not. As cool as that is, I don't think that's going to win. I imagine it's going to be either Endgame or Star Wars. What do you guys think? Oh, I think it's going to be Lion King. Yeah. Okay. So I haven't seen that. That's all CG. I, I mean, Lion King. So the opening of that film is a shot for shot remake. It's maybe the first, what, like five or six minutes, Norm? Shot for shot remake of the of the Circle of Life open, cold open of Simba's birth. Hmm. From the animated thing, mm-hmm. and I, if if you showed it to me, I wouldn't have known that it was like not actual animals. So the way you describe hmm. that is is the way you evaluate, and this is as much a question for the panel in the room as it is for people who work in visual effects out there who may be listening to the podcast. Is the way you evaluate the quality of visual effects, the ability to hide the fact that it is a visual effect, or is it? the fact that you're showing something that could not be done with a practical effect in in camera. So, Like, for example, Thor, Hammer, Mjolnir, Thanos, all these, cr- uh, c- uh, the amount of crazy effects you might see in a movie like Avengers Endgame could, be, I mean, technically could be done you know, with prosthetics, but be very difficult to do a spaceship flying into Earth's atmosphere without visual effects. But that is an overt visual effect. Is that more difficult to integrate that, make that look like reality than it is to do something like a completely digital human character or creature that then hides the fact that it is a visual effect or the kind of visual effects that might be set extensions that like, that might take a green screen shot and, or, you know, what is your qualifier there? Um, so, well, so, so I, when I, I judge, I, I'm a part of a judge panel for a couple of VR awards. Um, and we have similar criteria to what the Academy uses for the for their specialist categories, right? Like, so the, the criteria we use, and I think that it applies here, is when what's pushing the medium forward. So 
you know, in some cases, that's going to be something that's overt. That's, you know, a spaceship that we've never seen before or, um, you know, uh, the water, the water bits at the end of Endgame, right? When the water is rushing in and there's, there's, you know, Doctor Strange stands up and, and serves as a magic dam. Mm-hmm. Um, or performance capture without ping pong balls. Yeah, exactly. Or performance capture without ping pong balls. Or um, the first time we saw de-aging with Rogue One with with uh, or, or the virtual character vir- virtual character in, in Rogue One with Peter, Peter Cushing. Um, but then sometimes sometimes it's something that, that like is really mundane, like like the ping pong balls, like doing the, f- the face capture without ping pong balls. And I and I think I mean I think that's why these awards are, are somewhat flawed because to give a single oh, award and to say in this year, this is the one movie that should be recognized above all others uh, to win the award for this category is to make a decision about the type of qualifiers that you're rating it on. I mean, the movie, the fact that the movie 1917, which is does not have a ton of overt visual effects. And you would think that its accomplishment is more in cinematography or in <laughs> editing, but the fact that it's nominated for the visual effects category... Does that surprise you? It does surprise me. You're the only one here who has seen it. Yes, because, yeah. I mean, there are things that are clearly visual effects, whether it's sex engine or, you know, uh, a, a, some type part of the battle, right? Explosion or something. But I, I think that their visual effects accomplishment here is probably in the way they blended the cuts, and which is a <laughs> direct tie into the cinematography. And it is completely... Um, uh, it's transparent here. Like you don't, you don't notice the visual effects, uh, but it, I, mean, I, I want to read the Cinefix article about this to, mm. to know about what about what, what did they do? What did they add? What who, who you know in, in post? I mean, I, I think I think a lot of this also is in how how this award is worded, right? Like what the language of the award is, um, because that's that's going to make a difference. Like if it's if it is pushing the medium forward, that's one thing. If it's the most representative, the you know the best execution of visual effects for the year, that that's a different kind of category and different criteria. Good competition, regardless. These are yeah. all films that could possibly win it. It or also really great films is a category where you actually have a discrete uh, number you can associate with number of effects shots. How many effects studios worked on it, which are, may not, you know, correlate perfectly with the quality of it, but that you don't have. Like you can't say, you know, directors, they spent this many shooting days on this. And so it should be acknowledged. Like you can say, wow, an endgame, right. a movie endgame had, you know, three thousand yeah. effect shots. Yeah. Right. And we and it was the collaboration between, you know, a, a dozen studios, different yeah. you know, effects companies. By that metric, it would have to be Lion King, I imagine, because it's nonstop. Or endgame, one or the well, other. I'm just saying as, as a way to create a short list. Yeah. As a way to I, then you, to point your eyes to, okay, maybe this should be yeah. um Acknowledge. Wasn't Forrest Gump up for this award? Because that was. that is Benjamin famous. Benjamin Button, Forrest Gump. That's famously a movie that had trans, as you was as you said, transparent special effects where you can't see that they're there. Yeah. Well, yeah. you could. The ping pong game. The ping pong game. No, but like when they superimposed him into pick scenes with Nixon and stuff like that, it was yeah. pretty apparent. I, I like. I think. I think the stuff like it would. I'd be interested to see what they're going to show because they always show clips of the things that that are, they feel are representative during the show. Um, and I'll be interested to see which, uh, you know, whether, and if it's for the suits, like, is it for the time suits? Is that why Endgame is here? <laughs> oh, wow. Because those are all virtual. Yeah, right, 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 right. Like there's no, there were no physical time suits. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That's funny. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. Virtual costumes. Yeah. Uh, okay, best picture. Best picture. A, uh, Joker. It's gotta be Joker. Is, 11 this is nominations. the category where the Academy can pick up to 10 <sighs> movies. <laughs> It's you know, and just to be clear, they added ten movies because they wanted to improve diversity. And I never understood why it's not just ten movies. It's not like there weren't ten great films this past year. There are always ten great films. That's to what? say that we're going to have eight or nine in this case, nine this past year, because being nominated really is an award in and of itself. Like the nominees get stuff, they get attention. Um, they'll always have nominee good the, seats for the Oscars. I don't think it dilutes. <laughs> right. I don't think it dilutes the the recognition that the other nine films get. It to mu- add a a film, it must be like the debates where if you only have one percent, then you're not invited. Yeah, there, there's a there's a threshold of votes that they have to yeah. get of the percentage of votes that they have to get in order to be continued. And I think they do a ranked list now for the nominees. Um, so this is probably one that the whole Academy votes on too. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. 
So four V Ferrari, The Irishman, Jojo Rabbit, Joker, Little Women, Marriage Story, 1917, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and Parasite. Very notable, Parasite was the first foreign language film uh, from Korea uh, to be in uh, contention for best movie of the year. I think two of these movies are on Netflix. And Netflix is, I was going to say, uh, it was a studio, if you consider them a studio, to have the most nominations out of any other studio. Really? Between Irishman and Marriage Story. And this is, and so they had to get in the theater, right? And they had an animated to movie too. Qualified. Yes. yes. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I, so, I mean, this is why you can't go see uh, Marriage Story or uh, in, in, on Netflix right now. God, That's why Booksmart it's coming to Netflix been here. at the end of the year. Oh, I didn't well, know. No, no, yeah, Booksmart could have been here. Booksmart could be easily like, been here. But, but I can see Irishman. It came out earlier. Oh, okay. It has to have a it has to have an exclusivity window or something. I see, I see. The um, like, look, there's like three movies here that you can immediately knock the off. The farewell could have no chance been here. of winning. I think the farewell got shafted because that's an incredible film. Yes. Um, I I don't think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I don't think Parasite. I think <gasps> Parasite's really good. I don't think Parasite's going to win because the Academy is a bunch of old races. Well, we're going to have a conversation um, about Parasite on the other podcast. Yeah. Adam wants to do that. Okay. I, I'll watch it this week then. So I'm ready for next then week. Then you basically you don't think Parasite shouldn't be on here. No, you no, haven't no. seen it yet. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> my, my, my estimation of why Parasite isn't going to win is entirely based on old people there's getting a 480p between, screeners and not watching dubbed. There's a difference between it, it's not going to win and it shouldn't be here. It 100% oh, no, no. should be no, here. No, no. I didn't say it shouldn't be here. I said it's not going to win. Got it. I, yeah. think, I think it's subtitled, by the way. Subtitled, yeah, sorry, not dubbed. Um, but yeah, the point is, Joker, there's, there's no chance Joker's going to win. I think Joker has a good chance of winning. I think it's going to be 1917. Uh, that's my guess. That would be my guess, too, even though I haven't seen it. But everything I hear about it is fantastic, and I can't wait to see it. Yeah. My favorite movie I've seen this year, or I On saw from list. last year, is uh, Little Women, which I thought was like some of the best performances I've ever seen in a movie. And, and, and writing. And it turns out, that I learned something about our... What's her name? Women. Greta, 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 Greta Gerwig. Gerwig. She has a rule on the set and she had it with, um, with her first film, um, Lady Bird, no cell phones. Oh. How about that? Interesting. I, and after seeing the movie, it's like, how are these people so naturalistically for, like, friendly with each other? I wonder if that has something to do with They're it. They're chatty. I think not. it was intentionally a loving performance. I mean, uh, that's the way she wrote it. And it's, it's a movie that ma made you feel warm and fuzzy because these people are so loving. There, there's no villain. Everyone's good. Like some it's flawed, like Totoro. Just like cars. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we're done with our top story of the week discussion. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, you got it. From cinema to the MCU, which... Did you hear about wow. this? Wow. Did you hear that uh, Scorsese got trolled by his uh, daughter, I yeah, believe? Yeah, I saw. <laughs> no. I that tweet had like 150,000 likes, so, 100,000, 50,000 retweets. For Christmas, Scorsese's daughter wrapped all of his presents in, <laughs> in Marvel, Marvel wrapping paper. Wrapping paper. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. He, he probably had a sense of humor about that. Nice job, Dad. I, I would hope so. Yeah. Um, but we have some MCU news. Of course, Black Widow is coming out uh, in two months, I believe. Uh, there was even um, uh, some new footage shown at uh, the national championship game. Well, there's a new trailer out. That's mm. the new trailer, new footage, a Got special it. special look. You know, a, a two minute mm -hmm. thing. Okay. I haven't seen that yet, actually. No, it stars. It's well, one of the co stars, the person with second billing, in fact, is from Little Women. Oh, Florence Pugh. Yeah. Yes, mm. from Midsummer and Fighting with My Family. Uh, but Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness has lost its director, Scott Derrickson. This is the first horror slash superhero movie entered into the C MCU, right? Well, that was the promise when they announced the title uh, at Comic-Con last year when Scott Derrickson came out and, and, and said it not only would have Doctor Strange, but also it would tie into WandaVision because Elizabeth mm -hmm. um, Olsen was going to also appear in it and, and it was going to go, his roots are horror. 
He yeah. had, had done horror films. And he and his co-writer are both uh, off the project. Now, this is not the same case as a Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, the firing of James Gunn. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would hope that maybe he's going to come back, they'll, they'll make, make up. But he will remain executive producer on the project. But the, uh, the announcement was that Marvel Studios and Scott Derrickson have amicably, amicably parted ways uh, due to creative differences, Ooh. the ominous creative differences, which Edward Wright also uh, left Ant-Man uh, for that same reason. I don't think they fire people from MCU movies. You just have creative differences. <laughs> no, they, they fired James Gunn. Well, what is, James what is, Gunn was fired because of, of a drummed up controversy about stuff he's done on that, Twitter 20 years ago, 15 he, years But ago. he was fired from yes. the MCU. What yes. does it mean to, to executive produce something that he's still on as that role? I mean, that can mean all sorts yeah. of things. It, it can, can mean, mean you put up money, like wrote a check. It can mean you mean, hired the producer and then the producer hires the rest of the people. Kevin Feige is the producer. No one's hiring him. He well, certainly he's EP. He didn't put up money, but but he, he's the producer because he's he's in charge of all of Marvel stuff. Yeah, like he's he's the you know where the buck stops just on what, his desk. What and, and there are some EPs that are just EPs by name, right? Yeah. Like you know, um, back when Sam Lee, Stan Lee was around, hmm. he had EP credit, and it could mean you just get a, a percentage, or it could mean that you get some say or recognition, or uh, like it could you, mean you're yeah. involved in you know final sign off on certain things, like casting and scripts and stuff like yeah. that. Okay, yeah. you're you're in the room. <laughs> you deserve to be in the room when the important decisions are but, made. But it can also mean literally like they have th they need thirty million dollars to finish this movie, and you're like, hey, I, I'll take I'll give you thirty million dollars in exchange for a cut of the back end, and that can be you know the order in which they too. list the EPs in yeah. the opening credits or the closing credits will tell you a lot. Also, yeah, in terms the, of amount of involvement, closer to the beginning, of, the better. Type interesting, of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they don't have a new director yet, but uh, this is presumably it was going to start production later this year. McG. Don't screw it up. I love the first one. Who would you want to direct? I mean, who directed Cabin in the Woods? Um, that, that was Drew something, right? Yes, Drew Goddard. Goddard. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I would have Drew Goddard is you're, my best. You're still on the horror like Ben. You want to see? That. I want a. I want like a mildly spooky Doctor Strange. Yeah. What a slap in the face, though, because. Kevin Feige had walked back before they make this announcement. They had said he, he had said at a, a conference or some some event that he you know it's not going to be a horror film. It'll be scary, but it, it's not going to be full on horror. Maybe not those words exactly, uh, but it sounds like they still wanted to have some of those light yeah. scary moments, but not make it full horror. I guess they could get a Drew Goddard to do that. I'm I gonna think, I'm going to say Christopher Nolan. They're not going to get Christopher, but Nolan. that would be good. They, they that would be great, and let's uh, fight me. That would be great. You think specifically if they, he was to come in for a Marvel film, you would want it to be Doctor Strange. Inception. Yeah. That's like the most Doctor Strange movie we had before Doctor Strange. Well, that's true. Kind of bring it. I I uh, the the reason I said Cabin in the Woods is because not take out the the hillbilly redneck zombie guys. This the overall spookiness of that is I think the appropriate level of spookiness for what's probably going to be a PG-13. Like, we don't want body horror. We don't want your your green monster or whatever, you know, the the hostile guy's up to now. You, you want, like, thoughtful and scary because it's thinking for a Doctor Strange movie, not giant monsters. Terry Gilliam. No, maybe hey, not. I'm there. Terry Gilliam, Doctor Strange movie? Mm. I'm, I Sign me up for that. It, it'll never come out and it'll take 15 years and... He'll probably post something that's shitty on Twitter or something afterwards. Um, There'd be a Blu-ray 20 years later with his cut in it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you heard, you know, they're going to release the uh, Trevor Out cut. The script for that leaked this morning for Rise of Skywalker. No. You're joking. Yeah, no. What? Somebody posted the Trevor Out script for Rise of Skywalker this morning. I don't know if it's real. I don't know who did it. Wow. But that's the thing I saw. You have to go to the dark web here. for that stuff. <laughs> Look, man, you just turn, you turn the Bitcoin and then you, you <laughs> turn the you Bitcoin turn, you, you, fifteen degrees. Yeah, you got to go to the ATM under the, the under the last send them moon's a QR light, code the last and, sun's light on the solstice. You can get whatever you want if you're on the dark yeah. web. Mm, well, maybe you can find uh, one. thing I'd like to find on the dark web is a screener for Picard. <laughs> okay, because the premiere for Picard, yeah, it's out. Like they, somebody's seen it. it was the, out, the, they, they should. The premiere was last night. The premiere yeah. was last night as a recording list, and the show premieres for the public in a week and a half's time. Thursday, right? What, what's oh, the so word? a week from the publication of this podcast. Yes. 
Are people positive? I don't know. They've already greenlit season two. Well, that doesn't mean anything. CBS is, CBS <laughs> makes bad decisions you don't constantly. Trust them. No. I think they showed three episodes, is okay. what I heard. I trust Patrick Stewart. I think if he wants to do a second season, and they wouldn't have greenlit it without him, that it's good. You don't trust Patrick Stewart? I'm trying to think. Has Patrick Stewart ever been anything that sucked? And I can't I'm think sure of he has been. In, he's, he's been in a lot of Charlie's things. Charlie's Angels? That was okay. He wasn't in Charlie's Angels. That was uh, Bernie Mac and Bill Murray. He was in Charlie's Angels. Was he the bad guy? He I was, think in that Variety interview this, from this past week, he does mention that. And he, he says that was just good popcorn fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go have good pop, popcorn fun with Sir Pat anytime. But he's pretty serious about this. And he was very serious about staying away from Star Trek until they came to him with some new ideas. And I think, I think this is going to be quite different from Next Generation. Look, like what I, what I would have <laughs> expected was that Gene Roddenberry vibe, positive, optimistic. No. I don't think it's going to be all I that. think it's going to be dark and gritty. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a reflection oh, yeah. of the world as it is today. Full of gray areas. I, I think in many shades of gray. Patrick Stewart said that this is in Between many ways three and five lights. A, a reaction, <laughs> a response of his to Brexit and the Trump administration. So here's to here's, have a defeated Picard, to have a pessimistic, well, cynical Picard, a Picard that's been let down by Federation. Mm. Yeah. If you think about it, you know that's where the JJ verse went. It's to full fascist Starfleet almost immediately. Yeah, section all, 31. all that section thirty one stuff is is not Roddenberry esque, so maybe Picard is going to dismantle section thirty one from the inside. You know, one of the first um, Star Trek conventions, one of the early ones I went to, I asked I, I, someone like Rick Berman or something. Was did on you stage, ask a question? But more of a comment. I did ask a question, <laughs> but it was more about will we see more of section thirty one because it was when DS nine was airing. I'm sorry, can you guys define that? Section thirty one is the Black Ops. CIA, is the CIA-like covert shadow group within the Federation that breaks all the rules to subvert enemy empires. And uh, it was introduced in Star Trek DS9, hmm. um, pre-Dominion War, which you haven't seen, of course, but also they brought it back in the J.J. Abrams um, in Star Trek Into Darkness. Well, it's as, in Discovery a lot too. And it is the, the group that's led by Carol Marcus's father, uh, played by oh, right. Peter Weller, who uh, they bring back in Blackmail Khan, and they're the ones who 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 fight Khan. Oh, Benedict Cumberbatch is Khan. Whoa, you mean the second JJ? The second JJ. Yeah, JJ two. Oh, I had no idea. Okay, the one yeah. with the good cold open. Yeah. Okay. So that that section thirty one that was a callback to the group that was shown in DS nine. Okay. And then it was also revived in Star Trek Discovery as this kind of black ops shadow organization. They they torture Jeremy. They're bad people. Yeah. But when I asked the question, they use money. The EP said, you know, section 31, exactly like you said, was, is not in the spirit of what Gene Ronberry envisioned for Star Trek. Yeah. And yet we just got a lot more of it. I, I've got your, I've got your, your pitch for Picard without Patrick Stewart. You're afraid that season two won't have Patrick Stewart? I'm afraid that they're going to bring back Tom Hardy as young Patrick Stewart. It's no, just be all too flashback. For them. That's probably true. <laughs> uh, where I think the, the real genuine fear is that there are the name of Picard, like Skywalker, will be bestowed onto someone who's not Patrick Stewart and you're going to follow the journey of a new character. Now, mm. there's a little bit of silver lining to this, is that Patrick Stewart is signed on for season two of Picard, so it's going to be Patrick Stewart. And he survives. Okay. Presumably, maybe, in yeah. some way, maybe it's flashbacks. We don't oh, okay, know. Okay. We don't know if he's going to be there all the episodes. Right. Getting get there in age, but Brent, he's going to be. Brent Spiner's in it. We don't know even know if he's alive. Right. Exactly. Right. Data, data's alive. Brent Spiner's alive. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, but one of the things that they did say at the Star Trek Picard premiere, maybe it was upfronts as they were announcing season two, was that by the end of Picard, Star Trek Picard, however many seasons it runs, they want to at some point have all the principal actors of Star Trek Next Generation make an appearance in one way or another. We're well, that's superfluous, but okay. Back great, great. The fan service. Fine. Hmm. The cast members. So, I, yeah, I'm going to watch this. I don't have anything else They to didn't want to stop excited. Next Generation. The cast? Yeah. The they cast. were willing to keep going? All of them. They, huh. they want, everyone wanted to keep going, including Patrick Stewart. They stopped because they wanted to push it to films. And, wow. and DS9 Paramount couldn't like, do film yeah. and show, and probably because of contract negotiations. Yeah. They got too expensive. Probably at some point. Maybe. Riker's really beard had, his, had a real good agent, and, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, if Star Trek Picard isn't your Star Trek cup of tea, and I don't know why it wouldn't be yeah. Earl Grey hot, 
you're gonna get two more live action series. <gasps> live action series. What are Whoa. they on deck? WandaVision. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what they are. And Alex okay. Kurtzman. Oh, please tell me it's the Data Wharf. Is is the de facto? Well, it might not even be next gen. I, I just want a Data open, Wharf open buddy cop drama. On, I want on. them to go out and go on road trips and have adventures and solve crimes. <laughs> Alex Kurtzman, who was supposed to direct Star Trek Beyond. Yeah. And then the back, they, for some reason, didn't let him do it. He directed then The Mummy for Universal, the Tom Cruise one. It didn't work out. Ooh. So he's now kind of like the mastermind between for the Star Trek CBS All Access universe. Do you Perfect. think he knows more Discovery. about Star Trek than you do? Yes, 100%. Okay. All right. Uh, he co-wrote the with Robert Orsi the J.J. Uh, Abrams Star Trek movies. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And also Transformers. Uh, well, but one of those was good. He has a five-year plan mm. for the Star Trek TV universe. So are they calling this like the STU, the Star Trek universe? I don't know. Or STTU? But there are currently two series outside of Discovery, Picard, and Section 31 is a show they've already announced. Wait, wait, what? So they're, they're doing a fascist show? They're doing a, they're doing a dark Star Trek show. <sighs> wow. And that's right. not one of the two, though? That's not one of the huh. two. Set your phasers to waterboard. He wow. says they have not been announced yet. Well, I've, I've always said I wanted to see one about the underlings, the recruits, the new... Oh, Lower Decks. The, yes. Well, I want to see a show all the, about Lower Decks. There's two questions. There's, I think there are two paths here. One is Lower Decks, which is one of the best Star Trek episodes. All time great. It's about the, the crew, the crew, uh, the crew the, members yeah. who are not part of the, the leadership, who are not part of the, uh, the bridge crew. Mm -hmm. And there's also Starfleet Academy. Which is a separate show. Also. Oh, but then you got like this thing where you're always in one place. But that's a cheap way to make it's a show. It's about the people, though, Jeremy. It could be the West Wing, but in, in San Francisco, in Star Starfleet Academy. And you're both right, but I never watched uh, Deep Space Nine for that reason. So I'm just saying, give me a spaceship. Look, I'm with you that Deep Space Nine was too boring for like 14-year-old <laughs> me, 15-year-old me, whatever, whenever it was when it came out. A lot of fans of Star Trek Discovery are petitioning for uh, Anson Mount to have his own Chris Pike show i like i like him a lot and just like discovery started rough with the first season and that by the end of the second season i was all all in on that i like it a lot it so it could good. be the adventures of the, the voyage of the enterprise mm -hmm. as helmed it, by it, it's not pike from the jj verse is it no it's anson mount different it's, guy it's yeah. pike no, from the original it's not bruce greenwood it's pike from the menagerie episode of tos and i think rebecca romaine is number one right yes yeah she is yeah very good yes wow okay and Section 31 is uh, is going to be focused under Michelle Yeoh's character. Oh, um, oh, so it's from past second, Section 31. It's past, it's future past Section 31. I mean, it's all Discovery time frame. Okay. Yeah, although we don't know whether oh, right. the new whether show yeah, is yeah, yeah, going to yeah. be Discovery time frame or Picard time frame. Some business happens. Yeah. A shared universe, a shared Star Trek universe. I hope it's more Picard time frame and less Discovery time there, frame. There was something about Picard, though, that incorporates the J.J. verse. And I, and I thought the J.J. verse was its own timeline. But it is his own timeline. But isn't, isn't there something shared between both? No. There's something like is, like involving well, the jumping the, off point is. involving the Klingon homeworld. Something like something about that. Romulan homeworld. Is that what it was? Maybe it's. Oh, you know what? Okay. The JJ verse is a separate timeline that got spun off the moment that the Narada, the Spock's ship, Nero's ship, Nero's ship, oh. mining ship with Borg technology See, I, I did that. was oh, able to use the red matter to tr go backward in time. Now, Nero was a miner who uh, has this massive ship. It's incredibly, in terms of scale, it's a like big ship, massive, massive ship. Planet Breaker. Uh, uh, mining ship. Yeah, sure. Yeah. sure. But uh, he, his, his plot for vengeance was because Spock failed to save Romulus. Yeah. And because the sun went nova. Wait, I thought Spock was using the red matter to go back in time so that he could maybe go back and save No, Romulus. Spock was trying to use the red matter to throw it into the sun of Romulus. Uh, Romulus to save it. To save it, but missed it. Sun went nova, Romulus destroyed. Mm -hmm. So why didn't he go back in time and then do it in the past? No, 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 stop. Go. All right. And so th in the core, in the prime Star Trek universe... Romulus is destroyed. Spock has disappeared. He went back in the past oh, and died. Yeah. And Nero's gone. But Vulcan still exists in the prime Vulcan universe. exists, but Romulus is gone. Oh, oh, presumably, the that's oh. the world in which Picard takes place because Picard, one of his legacies was to try to join Spock in reunifying 
the Vulcans and the Romulans. And and one of the, so, so what I read was that could be one of his great failings that he He's failing not only to reunify these two peoples to have this shared ancestry, but also to let one completely be, go to be destroyed and fail to save them. Mm. Boom. Yeah. Okay. And so, I bet that's one of the plot points. So that's where we're at coming next Thursday. My son wants to watch the four next gen films. He should. Before Thursday. So we might do that. You have a week. Yeah. All righty. Uh, moving on. Uh, some movie news. You got two trailers that came out this week. Birds of Prey, the second trailer. This is the DC Cinematic Universe Harley Quinn spinoff movie. This is Suicide Squad 2. Suicide Squad 1.5. Okay. With um, Huntress. With Huntress. Uh, Cassandra Cain, Detective Montoya, uh, and the villain is Ewan McGregor's Wait, Black it, Mask. Isn't Cassandra Cain Batwoman? She Bat is girl. Batgirl in the comics. This is a different... Different Cassandra Cain. Cassandra Cain, or okay. different version. She's not going to be Batgirl. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Should I care about this, Norm? Yeah. Uh, I think if you enjoyed Margot Robbie's take on Harley Quinn, then this is going to be right up your alley. Okay. Did you? Did you enjoy that? That was the, the the bright spot in an otherwise dark film. Will Smith is not in this movie. That's more points in its favor. All right. Uh, the other, the new trailer uh, on the Marvel slash Sony side is Morbius. Yeah, it's like, a, it's, it looks like a Spider-Man movie. It is a, Sp a Spider-Man. This is a Sinister 7 Sinister movie? 6. Sinister 6. Uh, do you know what Morbi who Morbius is? Uh, he's a dying guy. No, I didn't even mean Spider-Man. I meant Batman. Because he's got a, he incorporates a bat in, into his life Wait, I th I thought in order to save himself. I Morbius thought is an anti-hero mm -hmm. and it's a tragic villain in the Spider-Man universe. It, much like- They're all tragic they're villains. They're all tragic villains. Yeah. It's Dr. Octopus who wants to save- Green his, Goblin. Yeah, green, green Goblin's more of an asshole. Black uh, Cat. She's an anti-hero. Black yeah. Catwoman. Uh, but Morbius, he has a doctor with blood disease. He finds some- yeah, some way to save himself through a bat, a bat, and becomes a vampire. So he's, he's like Mr. Freeze, Morbius, but with bats. The living vampire. He's a vampire. He's a vampire. He needs blood. He needs blood. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So and blood bank. <laughs> the question is, does this exist in the MCU? No, it's Sony's film. It's like Venom yeah. is a Sony Spider-Man property. Yeah. But the Vulture appears at the end of this trailer. Michael like, Keaton's like, Vulture, like, and he is in the MCU. Wait. So it's like pre-Spider-Man? No, after Spider-Man: Homecoming. Oh wow. Vulture presumably is broken out of prison. Because he's on the raft, he's, right? I, or something. Yeah, he, in, yeah. in, in, uh, in Spider-Man, he's in prison, but presumably he, he's out but it, but it's, by the end of this. It's Michael Keaton? It's Michael Keaton. See, I thought that was just Michael Keaton being Michael Keaton, like a little no. Batman nod. No. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> That's really funny. I mean, yeah. I wonder if when, they, when, when, when uh, Tom Holland managed to pull Disney and Sony back together, they expanded the terms of the relationship. And now all of these things are getting pulled into the, MC, into the larger MCU. It's, it's Sony being really bold about their rights to Spider-Man. Because they own Vulture, presumably. They have Venom, they ha which made a ton of money. Yeah, yeah. They own Venom 2. So they anything Spider in Spider-Man's right. Spider universe is sort of theirs. So yeah. you, won't, you won't see Rhino or Doc Ock or Green Goblin you in, might. You might in, the future. in the MCU movie. In the MCU movie, correct. Yeah, right. yeah. But you, you will just see Spider-Man. Yeah. They're super friendly, though. Like, they could do it. Yeah. Uh, within a neighborhood. Uh, and then uh, one last thing, while CES is over, one last story from CES. I read about this after the fact, but Westworld was there. Now the Westworld premiere, season three premiere, it's coming up soon, uh, I believe in March. Uh, I want to say March 13th, March 15th. Ha ha, had very close. March 15th is when Westworld season three is coming out. This is the, the Aaron Paul is going to be in this one. Uh, it's presumably in not in Westworld, if no spoilers, but it's in the, the real world and with maybe some other so It's like the third Matrix movie. This is going to be great. And <laughs> they did an activation at CES. They've done this before. So you remember like a, a year or two years ago? Such a weird word. They, I know. I, I, I feel Look, like you got to activation saying, it up. Saying it. <laughs> but they had an event at CES two years ago where they took uh, press and other people out to this ranch 
yeah. where they essentially did a live performance as if you were in Westworld. Oh, thank now, the you. problem was that half the people there were dressed as CES journalists with their badges mm -hmm. and their day clothes. And so it was not as immersive Newbies. as you would hope. Wait, they didn't take you in the room and have this mostly naked person give you a white hat or a black hat? No, that was a separate type of activation they oh, had okay. at New York Comic Con three years ago. Oh, yeah. That, those hats were pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're okay. Okay. Uh, and, but what they did for this one as a tie-in is they had their own CES keynote. Hmm. It was a parody, sat satirical take on a CES keynote Just from what company I've always wanted. of an in-universe company. Uh, and the hmm. guests that they invited, like hmm. the press people they invited, had them fill out these forms ahead of time. They attended the event and then there was some dinner or some like cocktail party or something after the keynote. Yeah. And all the actors that they hired to uh, to be the service to be people robots, yeah. were robots and they knew everything about the attendees. So they had people watching on cameras and talking to their ears? They did research on all the attendees, social gross. media research. Super and it was gross. as much a commentary as, as how much information you have in the world as it was on you know, CES. You went to one of these. Did you go to this one? I didn't go. I wish I went. I wasn't at CES. Okay. I wish I went to this one. Yeah. So they, they Googled people at the bare minimum. Wait, this was this year you're talking this about? This was like oh, I gotcha. a week ago. Okay, gotcha. And they, they found information about their personal lives. That's crazy. And they integrated it into these scripted conversations where they had the actors find the people and then hug them and, yeah. and pretend to know them. And the reports I've read from people who did go say they, they wasn't, wasn't 100% spot on. And, you know, very quickly the attendees realized what was going on. They played along. It wasn't it spot was, on. Like they got things wrong. They got names. Like a, a okay. name would be wrong. Like they go up to him and say, I loved you and I robot. <laughs> like, yeah, that wasn't me, man. <laughs> that would be a tough, tougher Google search. Yeah. They would have to have like three people <laughs> work on that one. Right. At Will Smith. But I'm sure they went through Twitter history. Wow. Like LinkedIn history. I'm sure they went through all this stuff. Um, and presumably these were tech journalists that have a big presence and a digital footprint. Yeah. Online yeah. to make it easy yeah. for for the, the marketing company to to dig up info. Uh, I would have loved to have gone just to experience it. The the kind of surrealness and the discomfort of having a stranger, a quote unquote robot, you know, come up to you so, and, and present you with all this personal information. So I did years ago an off brand. Um, Westworld escape room, like a, like a, like it wasn't branded, but it was just in a Western themed bar in LA and they hired actors to be the robots. And it was so discomforting talking to someone who was pretending to have no agency or free will in, in that way. It was, it was very, very unsettling in a way that I was not at all expecting. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, so not I, not for me. I get weirded things. out going to VR events and people know my name, you know, <laughs> and and I'm talking about the the PR agents. You know, they do they they have a file and they have a file. They yeah, do exactly. have a file. Yeah, yeah. The, the worst ones are the ones that drop in like three bits of three bits of info. Oh, the head of the PR meeting. How's your How's your daughter? She's <laughs> seven now, huh? <laughs> well, I guess not for a couple of weeks. I'm sorry. Do I know you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, no, definitely to to take you off guard. Put you at a disadvantage. All right. Before we move on to our next segment, uh, segment I want to let you know that this week's episode of the Stolian Test is made possible with generous support from Lutron Caseta Smart Lighting Systems. A lot of people think you need smart bulbs to get smart lighting, but there is, as you all know, a smarter way. Caseta Smart Dimmers and Switches replace the switch on your wall so that all the lights are controlled by that switch will act smart. Think about all the places in your home where one switch controls multiple bulbs, like ceiling lights in the kitchen, bathrooms, and more. With Caseta, you'll save money by replacing the switches instead of replacing all those bulbs. Smart bulbs are only smart when the switch is on. If someone flips it off, you can say goodbye to smart control and connectivity. But Caseta switches are always smart, even if the switch is off. And with Caseta dimmers, you don't need to buy smart bulbs to enjoy smart lighting. You get the best of both worlds, smart lighting control from an app or your voice, and control right at the switch. Get smart lighting the smart way with Caseta by Lutron Smart Switches. Learn more about Caseta at lutron.com slash test. That's L-U-T-R-O-N dot com slash test. <laughs> All right, uh, let's talk about E3 a little bit because we're already getting in January. Can't be close to E3. We're not close to E3. It's six Halfway months there. away. Yeah, yeah. Sony's not going to be there. What? Again. Again. Last year they weren't there. 
They, they have their own events. Like they have state yeah. of plays throughout. They've taken a page from Nintendo's highly successful, like multi times a year broadcast of announcements. And they definitely have the resources to put together their own on location in, invitation events around the time of things like E3 or GDC. What, what, what did they do last? Did they have like. They had an on location the, thing in LA. But did they like have a, a big. Week before. It was like like a what big, happened to their show floor was, space? Wasn't that thing with the big tent? Yeah. And yeah. You'd, you'd walk through and, and oh. it would become like the, the parts of their games. That sounds great. But I don't know who t- took up their show floor like, space. Like, so remember, it was. Was it Konami who used to keep their show space and would just have like a sign in the middle that said Konami will return to E3? Or something. It was like one meeting room and a sign and just a big open area in the middle of the floor. I, I just, I don't know. I, yeah, that's fine. It's weird that they're doing that in a year they're launching a console, but I guess that it doesn't matter. That is the weird thing. That means they don't have a keynote too, right? Yeah. Or do they still get a keynote? Well, they could still do a stream. Like the, it's just their own stream. It doesn't matter, yeah. right? I guess they that's can, right. They can just partner with a Twitch. You bring in some, or some influencers. Definitely not a mixer. <laughs> no one's going to take their time slot. Like if somebody announces a stream for eight, eight o'clock on Monday night, like no one's going to. Do one at eight o'clock Monday night. World exclusive. <laughs> yeah. PS5. Well, Here it is. And so Sony has traditionally had the morning after Microsoft. So like they famously at the launch of the PS4, when Microsoft f- flubbed explaining their weird DRM, no disc DRM sc- scheme for the for you know Xbox One games, Sony came out the next morning and was like, hey, and if you want to share a game with your friends, here's how it works. And it, Adam Boys <laughs> handed a disc <laughs> to the, to yeah, like yeah. And he put it in and played the game. It was very straightforward. It doesn't say anything about the... It doesn't indicate anything. We can't infer anything with the announcement that, that, about the readiness of PS5. But presumably, since we know PS5 is coming out... It'll be, it's ready. At the end of this year. Like, it, yeah. CPUs are done. Like At this point, the, the hardware is more or less locked. Well, it's about titles then. Yeah, it's about which games are going to hit launch. And it's about well, like whether the dev kits are in shape and whether they felt like they're going to be performant at, in time for the for the E3. But like they'll, they'll be manufacturing hardware in earnest by the time E3 starts. Unfortunately, so. they'd, um, there, there probably won't be a new VR solution in time for launch. That's the rumor. I think that's reasonable, we'll right? Have, we'll have to wait for PSVR 2. You don't think they'll hint at that even? I hope so. But I, I believe it'll be compatible with the first version. Do you think it'll be a They've said that before. For them to... You, you think whatever hardware they'll release for version 2 will be compatible with... No, no, no. That the, the PS5 will use current... Oh, yeah, PSVR. yeah. Sure. That's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I, I think that... I feel like they've said that, actually. I thought so, too. I'm just not you know, super plugged in. Yeah. Mm. But I'm excited about the second gen. I, I, that's much more exciting to me than even the PS5. You think, because the attach rate we talked last week is reasonable, like 5 million, 5 million people total, have, yeah. have bought PSVRs. You think that's a compelling enough factor for when they announce PS5 to have that in the announcement to make to make sure people are locked into buying PS5 as opposed to Xbox One I don't know. Series well, Xs? Well, I mean, we've seen a couple of games now that have reached a million units sold. Like the Beat Saber and Job Simulator have both both crossed a million units on all platform across all platforms, and you have to imagine PlayStation is a pretty significant chunk of that for both of those titles. I think you want that in the store in the mainstream press. You want people to be reporting not only is PS5 coming out and whenever they announce it, but here's another differentiator. It works with your old shit. It not only works with your old shit, it will support PSVR well, whenever a second version of it yeah. comes out so that when they're asking people to plop down $400, $500 for a console at the end of the year. On the other hand, they don't have any competition from Microsoft in the VR space. They don't have to present that in order to well, balance anything. the competition anything. is the quest. Yeah, the competition's quest. Absolutely. You know, you're talking preaching to the choir here, but but as far as they're concerned, uh, you know, probably quest doesn't, doesn't, isn't like that scary. It, it should be. Well, because all the kids, it's what the kids want to play in school. But, right. I, but I mean, here's the thing is if they roll out PSVR two and PS five at the same time, then somebody is looking at, and, and your son comes up and it's like, Hey dad, can we get the new PSVR and PS five? And you're like, Oh yeah, that's a grand. <laughs> you're not going to feel like, how yeah. well did that work out for them with the PS three? When they were like, it's going to be $600. Nobody bought it. If they save it, it does give them a huge story. End of year one. Promote, yeah, yeah. Either yeah. end of year or by, you know, next E3. Yeah. Mm. Uh, on the Xbox side, we saw that first image of the Xbox Series X. Sorry, that's Xbox One. It's Xbox Series X. And now there's an interview that says that Xbox Series X won't have exclusives, next-gen exclusives, for a while. I mean, this goes with their... This goes... You know, so, the, so the story is 
games that come out for the Xbox One Series X also will work on the Xbox One and Xbox One X. So correct? what is the incentive for people to buy Xbox One I don't think they're, Xbox I mean, Series X? Well, if you have a gaming PC, you don't have one, right? Because everything's come to Windows Store and Game Pass. So, like, I don't know who buys this console unless it's just people who buy Xboxes. But they're not going to have a Halo game? They're not going to have anything exclusive to Xbox Series X. So it'll all work on launch. the Xbox and also oh, Windows. You gotcha, gotcha. You might you might not get this you know a, a crazy feature in in this you know like a high frame rate feature or some type of ray tracing thing it, it but even if like you're using a control Z example if you have the RTX experience on Xbox Series X and you don't have that experience on Xbox One X that's not compelling enough to buy a new console. Well, I mean, what their bet is is that. They're, they're saying, hey, the console market has changed and the model that has worked since the N64 launched with Super Mario 64, a game that people wanted to play so badly they bought a console for. They're saying that those times are past and that now people are buying the console to make the services that they pay for better. So if you pay for Game Pass Ultimate where you get a, where there's a bazillion games on the service at any moment for you, then you, this is going to be the best way to play that unless you have spent $1,500 or $1,000 on a PC. And this is first party titles, first party stuff titles. like Halo, and but no third party would well console exclusives. Yes, yes. so like Sony's Spider Man game from a couple of years ago, console exclusive sold a bazillion copies. Nintendo, Microsoft is saying, hey, we don't need any of this business. Nintendo is still basing their entire model on only selling shit that people buy from Nintendo. It's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the console I'm most curious about because I don't know where its place really belongs. I haven't yeah. turned on my. The only time I turn on my Xbox One now is to play Xbox 360 games. Also, 4K Blu-rays. No, just Xbox 360 games. No. 4K Blu-rays only also work on Xbox, no. but not PlayStation. Not PlayStation Pro. Yeah. 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 Uh, moving on from consoles uh, to cell phones, we have uh, Samsung has uh, their Galaxy Unpacked event in early February. I think I'm going to that one because it's in San Francisco, so hopefully we get to see some cool stuff there. But everyone presumes it will be the uh, announcement of the Samsung Galaxy S20, um, and we've already seen a bunch of leaks and images of that uh, that phone already. Things that have been quote unquote confirmed or you know, in, in, shown in these leaks are a 120 hertz display, a, a fingerprint sensor that's under display, so ultrasonic under display fingerprint scanner, no headphone jack, of course, and maybe even 16 gigs of RAM on a smartphone. Man, nothing gets me more tuned up than a couple extra gigs of RAM on a phone. Look at all those cameras though. Yeah. That's too many cameras. It's like a spider. <laughs> What, what's the face? What's the notch sitch? Is there a notch or is it well, just a hole? I think it's the hole punch. I think hole, hole punch, punch is a new notch. I don't, I think I like, I don't the like the hole punch. Oh, there it is. Hole punch. Hole punch. Oh, man. That looks like, hole that punch looks like is a bunch worst of dead case pixels. Case hole punch misalignment between hole punch and the lens underneath is something that I noticed a lot of companies do hmm. and it bugs the hell out of oh, me. Oh, like the lens isn't centered under it's the hole? It's not centered under the hole. If yeah. the hole isn't centered on the phone, I'm going to be crazy. It will make me completely yeah, uh, unhinged. <laughs> well, if you want to hinge, you've got to go with um, I'm not, Galaxy no, Fold. No, no folded phones, please. Yeah, that'll, that'll give you the hinge. Uh, so notch is, notch is not ideal. We don't talk about notch on this podcast, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but a notch on the smartphone is fine. The hole is fine. None of I it, think the hole nothing is matters, uglier. Norm. Nothing, literally Just have nothing the matters. bigger forehead. Yeah. That's, I think, the, a, a totally fine solution. I don't think you need to punch a hole in the LCD, especially on Android phones when you then have UIs that, that can't don't handle. Can, Look, yes. it's a just, yeah, it's fine to have bezel. I stopped caring when they took away the headphone jack. Yeah, and this one doesn't yeah. have the headphone Everything's jack. been worse since the iPhone 5. You know, the OnePlus 7 uh, last year, the Pro had, they didn't use a notch. They didn't use a hole punch. They had a retractable camera a, a mechanism mm. the hand camera that, no, popped no thank you. up for the front facing oh, no. camera people have been very happy with that i was super skeptical it seems like in a year you're gonna have an impossible to use front camera they have tested it for what, like 300,000 cycles okay and they have videos showing how strong the hinges and it is or how strong that uh, mechanism is and i i can attest it is strong they're going the whole bunch looks like next year for one plus as well mm. Because they can. Yeah, why bother? Mechan Nobody wants a mechanical thing. Your phone's are already fragile it's, enough. It's like these phone companies just want to put on, put in new features because their R&D teams, to give the R&D team something to do. We, 
remember when we started testing and we were like, man, PCs are boring. Everybody's just, look, this one has a wood case. This one has a mechanical keyboard in it. Nothing ever changes. It's all the same. Hey, welcome, welcome to 2010 phones. 2010. Yeah. Phones were exciting back phones then. Phones were exciting and through like 2014. Yeah, like every year it was exciting. Yeah. Once the seven looked exactly like the six, it was like, who cares? Yeah. Have you guys used a phone with 90 hertz display? No. Uh, it's only used the, what is it, the iPad? Uh, iPad, yeah. Pro. Which that's 120 hertz. Okay. Yeah. And uh, phones, like both the Galaxy S20 and also the OnePlus, and there are other phones as well, the Seuss has one, has a 120 hertz panel yeah. from Samsung. Um, Seems like it would eat battery. It does. It does eat battery. Is it selective? Is it always 120 no, hertz? Or is it, oh, it's yeah. a variable, okay. It looks, I, I, I don't think we need necessarily 120. I think 90 is good enough for phones, but I'm you know, living with the 120. I, 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 I could be convinced otherwise. But that's something that I feel like a, Apple, and I, my guess is they're not doing it because of battery life. Yeah. But I feel like it would, from experiential standpoint, on your day-to-day, -day, thing you do the most is scroll web, web browsers, web pages, um, Twitter, yeah. right? The home screen, the extra smoothness is immediately noticeable. Yeah, I would imagine that 60 now looks like a frame, like a slideshow. My next upgrade for my PC is going to be a high refresh rate display. You know that there's some crazy ones at CES. Like the 360. 300 plus. I don't yeah. already talked to NVIDIA about them, yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I, I will come see that. Please do. <laughs> that, that, I can bring it in. It's, it's tiny. It's like a 24-inch 1080p panel. That's insane. It's for eSports. An insanely high frame yeah. rate. Is that necessary over 144? I, I want to... My whole pitch to NVIDIA was, hey, send me one of these so that I can try them at the different frame rates and see if you can see a difference. We looked into it because of VR. We looked into like what doctors, uh, people who study this There's stuff, no, say that the human limit is. And it's around 1,000. But the thing is, they like the science, like it's it's the science is questionable all the way through on that. Like it's, there's not, the studies have been for other things that that was the thing that they picked you know, up incidentally. Let's just say that a scientist said a thousand anyway. Yeah. And so that's like, if that's like a theoretical ballpark, yeah. 300 and what, 40? 60, I think. That's like getting there. And the, that's amazing. The thing NVIDIA said is that when you put an esports professional in front of like a professional Counter-Strike player yeah. in front of one of those panels, they had like a 30% higher headshot rate. Were well, they also on drugs? <laughs> I mean, probably <laughs> Adderall. Adderall. They're all Adderall. Yeah, or exactly, right? Something. Pop the Adderall. <laughs> you don't take advantage of the temporal resolution yeah, no. until you... You have the so you've got to be able to see time. I need yeah. more frames. <laughs> <laughs> no subframes. Yeah. Synced up, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, now we're back to the Bluetooth story. One of hey, the best things out of CES. Good callback. Hey, new Bluetooth standard. I did a whole episode of a podcast about this the other day. You okay, did? tell me about it. Tell, tell us about it. Uh, it basically replaces the low-level audio codec well, and it, pipe. It's uh, called Bluetooth LE audio, right? Right. Okay. Uh, it's it's low energy is what the LE stands for, not limited edition and not long <laughs> Ooh, extended. I would have been more interested if it was well, limited edition. Uh, but so the upshot is, it's a they've revamped the the core level audio pipeline and they've introduced a new codec that's more efficient mm -hmm. um, and better quality, so that you can have uh, basically it'll replace the shitty pre aptX um, Bluetooth audio pipeline that we've had and should provide much better battery life and, and add additional features. So for example, right now, if you have truly wireless earbuds, when the way the Bluetooth works is the signal goes to one of the earbuds and then it blasts through your skull from that earbud to the other one. And it does a little bit of a latency correction on the first one. So now it can do multi-point. And that means that even like if you're on an airplane and you and your whoever you're sitting next to on the airplane are watching the same movie on an iPad or something, you can theoretically blast that to both sets of AirPods. Well, that's actually two different features. At once. Two the, different features. The multi-point yes. is one thing, but then there's also the broadcast idea. Yeah. Where you can broadcast to an, an as far as I know, like they haven't said the limit, but multiple different par targets, which that's awesome. Yeah. Like if you want to lay in bed and watch TV with your headphones on so you're not annoying everybody in the house, then since, that's an option. Since college, I've always wanted the ability to listen on demand to what anyone else walking around me is listening to. If you were to what you know, open that up. If you I mean, were to say, like, you want to pod jack. I'm my own. No, he wants to. He wants to be squirted. Yes, at. Squirt. Yeah, you I'm want my, people to squirt you. I'm my own radio station within 50 feet, and anybody can listen to what I'm jamming nobody, to. Nobody else wants that. If they Jeremy. see me doing this. They're like, "What's he on?" No. Well, they, you got to wear the LED jacket where you can like have the name of the song and your then the four digit key code <laughs> to, <laughs> no, to check man. in on the back flashing <laughs> yeah. in, in RGB, you, and then you go, "Oh." Got to tune in to, to, to 1852 right there. I'm telling you, dude, that actually sounds really cool to me. You put on your AR glasses, and when you look at Jeremy, you see at the bottom left, like the old MTV right. music video thing yeah. with like the artist <laughs> right. and the song and the album and yeah. the label. And then 
you know, you can, you can jack in. You yes. Can get, you can, Hey, be yo, Jeremy, will you squirt some music? It's turntable.fm, but oh. in XR. But it's not like oh, it's squirting in real time into any number of people. Mm. No. I love this. <laughs> Unsubscribe. I- <laughs> Do you remember that stupid Wired article about pod jacking? That they the thing that they made up, where some guy was on the bus and he was like, "Oh, this." He just walked over to some woman and unplugged her headphones and plugged plugged her headphones into his phone so that's, she could listen to his music. That's rude. And I was like, "That's assault." Borderline. <laughs> it, borderline it would, assault. It would make the flash mobs mm, much easier discos. to sync up. The silent discos yeah. much easier to sync up. Oh yeah. Yeah, everyone tunes into nothing, the right frequency. Nothing mm-hmm. screams, I just watched Hackers, like, hey, I want to go see a silent disco. You know, you know, the problem is solved just by having FM tuners inside phones, again. I just mean, you just listen yeah, to the but radio. Then, and then you can broadcast Distortion. your own You're right, you're right. I, you know, that was what I was thinking in the zero, 90s. Zero latency. Right. If you want to hear more about Bluetooth LE, you can find on techpod.content.down. Yeah. Guess what? I what? do have to go. Oh, no. Oh, no. Jeremy needs to go. We're going to wrap this up really quickly. Hey, Super Mario, Super Nintendo World. Yeah, can you punch a block for real with a wristband? That's what I, I got from that video. I think that's exactly what it is. Universal Studios Japan. Later this year, it's going to, uh, yeah, ahead of the Olympic Games, later this summer, before the summer, is going to be opening uh, its Super Nintendo World Park. And there's a little bit of a, a preview trailer that doesn't really show any of the actual attractions. But it does indicate that you will, like Will said, have some type of wristband that will then track your progress mm-hmm. through the world of this park. You got to punch the question blocks. Coins, question blocks, yeah. power-ups. And the, a map of the park will be on your phone and it will look like a game world. It might get kids actually interacting. Why not combine this with a greater world you know, as a whole? Do a kind of... Um, a ring fit adventure rings. I love exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like the, the Pokemon game. Put or these grass all around town. I love it. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Get them out there. Get your high score. Mm-hmm. Like, like if they were physically there, like geocaching, mm-hmm. that'd be great. What mm-hmm. if, what if, but like, what's the power, like, do kids eat, like, like what's the... Magic yeah, mushrooms? Yeah, do want them to eat mushrooms? Flowers? No, but that's it, bad too. It can all be virtual. Kids just love collecting things. You get hats. That's true. You get hats. I do love Come collecting on. stuff. Mario Odyssey. Get, get a new hat. Uh, that's, yeah, okay. It's supposed right. to be a that's... highly technological park. I am curious about it. Yeah. There's that's... going to be one in the US as well. Oh, I think okay. Yeah, they have the license. I believe so. Oh, I can't wait for that to open then. Yeah, maybe maybe Florida. Um, one last story. Uh, Minecraft, Minecraft story. Uh, the creators of the Harry Potter Minecraft map it's this incredibly detailed Harry Potter like Hogwarts? recreation, Hogwarts, and uh, well, they uh, they uh, we'll see. <laughs> the modding team called Flu Networks. They're creating now a role playing experience inside this map. You don't just get to explore the world of Hogwarts in Minecraft, but you can solve puzzles, go on quests, shop at Diagon Alley, and fly over to the Quidditch pitch. Um, so it's going to be even more interactive. This shows the power of Minecraft. It's not an officially licensed thing, but the fact that it's these wow. hobbyist map makers are now incorporating real gameplay. Was there ever an MMO based on Harry Potter? No? I don't think so. I don't think so either. What a missed opportunity. No, MMOs were dead by the time Harry Potter came online. Yeah. Are they dead? I mean... Okay. Yeah, they became live games. Yeah. And that does it for technology news. Uh, before Jamie goes, um, I want to let you know that this episode is also made possible with support from Capital One. Capital One knows life doesn't alert you about your credit card, and that's why they created Eno, the Capital One assistant that catches things that might look wrong with your credit card, like over-tipping, duplicate charges, or potential fraud, and then sends an alert to your phone and helps you fix it. It's another way Capital One is watching out for your money when you're not not. Capital One, what's in your wallet? See CapitalOne.com for details. What are we doing? Let's do VR Minute. The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. What do we got in VR? I got five minutes. Oh, I got five. It can really be a five minute VR. What have you been playing lately? Both of you. I've been playing a lot of pinball. And this is not an easy thing to set up, but and it has to be on the Rift. So if you got a quest, you got to do Link. But you know, people have been emulating pinball machines for yeah. a long time. I know now. somebody who made a hardware controller for emulated pinball machines, <laughs> right? But I did that for VR pinball games because I feel like they crossed the threshold into the, this makes sense hmm. because you do got to move your head around to play pinball a little bit. It's not like joust. 
right? I love emulated video games and they work great in MAME, but emulated pinball games never have. Yeah, because you, yeah, yeah. you got to get some physical movement 3D. There yeah. because you got to read that, those physics in the ball. So that visual pinball is a thing where you can um, load up any, like they've just done every game. Like uh, the people who make, who make these. Are they licensed? Emula- emula- of course not. No, you got to download the ROM. Oh, you got to download the table. It's all been like hacked together by these people who, who love pinball. And now you can play that in VR. And I've been, and over the past couple of months, people have been making like dedicated VR cabinets where it's not just the table, it's the full cabinet and it's the legs and it's got an environment and you're in a room and you're standing on a floor. And it's just, it's so fun because every couple of days people release a new table and it's just like, hey, now I can play Taxi. Now I can play Theater of Magic. It's fantastic. So I've been doing a lot of that. I just got finished doing my judging stuff for the, for the VR awards for Dice. Um, and I played a ton of Blood and Truth, which is PSVR, right? PSVR mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. I, it's from the people who made London Heist, which was yep. one of the early PSVR demos that we saw. They were like, wow, this is like a real video game in VR in like 2015. Yeah. And it's really like, it is amazing what they managed to wring out of PlayStation hardware and, and what the PSVR can do, which is like, you know, the headset's fine. The controls are a little limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. Like the kind of... Like it's just a it's just a surprisingly delightful thing. Um, that and the other one was the curious, the curious the story oh, of the you stolen pets. That? How is that? It's awesome. Awesome. It is super duper good. Wow. Like it is a total sleeper. It looks like a kids game. It's it a is kind quest, of a kids it's game. Quest game. It's quest. I played it on Vive. Okay, it's so it's everywhere. Great. Um, the curious tale of the stolen pets is what it is. Right. And it's like this puzzle game. It, the art direction it is so good. It's all these little tiny worlds. Um, and it's not, it's not like super immersive or anything, but you can only play it in VR because of the way the perspective, there's a lot of perspective stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's voiced wonderfully. It's just, it's just a, it's the kind of game that I didn't expect to see in VR. What's the shooter we played? Oh my gosh. Um, it's on, use that memory. Hyper. It is hyper dash. Dash. That's the, that's the racing game. That's the racing game, isn't it? Is it hyper dash? It is hyper dash. Okay, great. Nice. Wow. <laughs> wow. I, I pulled that out of my butt. Okay. So that this is a, um, it's in beta. Yeah. You, you can go on, on to the discord. To the, yeah. You can, well, you have to find the discord by going to the Oculus quest, Reddit, subreddit. You'll find the discord link in there, like mm. buried in the, in the topics. Go to that, uh, download the beta to your computer, the APK, and then drag it over using side quest. Worth your time. So it's a multiplayer shooter 5v5 with good graphics. It's free locomotion, no jumping, but instead of jumping, you teleport and kind of warp your body right. onto pretty far. I think the range is really far. Yeah, the and there's warp. not much of a cooldown on the but teleport. The other cool movement mechanic is that there are these rails on the map, and you can warp onto the rail, and then you're gliding along like skateboard style. Like Jet Set? Like, yes. <gasps> and that's what makes it fun. <gasps> I think it's not, it doesn't move as fast as I want it to. They're tweaking everything. Is it a bar factory? Do you get sick? It's, I don't get sick. Oh, wow. Not at all. Okay. Now, there's a straight deathmatch mode, and, and there are bots in this. It's all multiplayer, so you, you're, they have servers right now with bots that fill up these maps. The bots are fine. They're fodder. Um, but the most fun mode is they do have a uh, escort the cart mode. You know, like... Um, like TF2. Like TF2 or and also Watch, Echo Overwatch, Combat. Yeah. And... Jeremy and I played that 2v2, well, some well, randos. 1v1 for a while. For, for a while. <laughs> yeah. And that was super fun. Yeah. Huh. Uh, you have your standard hit scan weapons. So you have your uh, kind of shotgun pistol, two handed guns. There's a rocket launcher that you can aim after you fired it. Um, and it does require quite a bit of timing and skill. That's it's, awesome. It's really rough. It's, it's totally free right now because they're, oh, you know, it's a beta. Yeah. Try it out because it's, uh, you know, for the quest, there's just not that many shooters that are really accessible and arcadey. And this is this is one. Okay, of them. so I go to the quest subreddit. I search for hyper dash, all one word. <laughs> you can probably, then I go to the Discord right. and I request a key from the Discord. Yeah. And then they send me an APK, knock, which I sideload onto the quest. Knock on the door, say, uh, you know, Palmer sent me. Jeremy sent me. Right. <laughs> that Jeremy right there. I'm, uh, trying to look, I'm trying to look at this game that I played... Um, a while, to, I, a couple the, weeks ago. What is the third person game, Jeremy? I can't remember the name of this. What is early access game in VR? Third person, you play like the stick figure. You don't mean the under presents? No, 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 no. Um, oh no, I don't know the name of that. But you were oh talking about like puppeting yourself. Yeah, it, it's this guy uh, released an early access. He's he's been posting on on Reddit 
Um, give me one second because I can actually scroll through my playlist to find it. But the idea is you can play it in either first person or third person. And in third person, you are essentially puppeting and it's full body. So they have kind of IK with free locomotion. So you're using thumbstick mm. for moving around, but the arms and looking around for this character is, is, you. is you. So it can get, they do a little bit of vignetting as you, as you turn left and right. Um, but I, the reason I picked this up was, you know, one wants to support the indie developer, but also because as we were talking about playing Jedi Fallen Order, I was wondering, could this game, like a third person action game, work well in VR, where you are puppeting the character, maybe you have free hand control, motion controls for the lightsaber, uh, but you're you're aiming and firing, um, and then you're looking around the environments, like, you know, kind of edge of nowhere, but with more action. Yeah. And I thought that'd be such a fantastic idea. And after playing this game for a little bit, I'm, I'm a little bit less convinced Ooh. about it. Um, there's a big disconnect between when you're puppeting the character, because when you're aiming, you're not pointing you as the god avatar where you want to fire. You're kind of aiming the hand up and down. It's a situation you need to cheat it a little bit probably. You 100% need to yeah. cheat it where once you zoom out in a third person view, I think it's better if then it, it, your hand aiming, your god hand aiming is where the, the puppet aims and it kind of you know triangulates to that position. Yeah. Uh, whew, I want to remember the, the name of this. Um. Well, hey, while you're playing, I played the new Pistol Whip map that came out. I didn't Pistol know there Whip was level. one. Yeah. yeah, it's very good. Yeah? Like, it's it's very clear that they were watching all the people that are streaming that game, playing it, and finding out what people like and what they respond to. Free? Oh, uh, yeah. It's all, I think I think all the DLC for that game is... Mm -hmm. it, the, the, I can't remember. I don't want to okay. say that. But, yeah, it was free, and it's it's lovely and very, very good. Okay. Um, I also finally played Beat, Sixer, Beat Saber 360. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's really hard. My, it's very difficult. My son is totally hooked on it. And really? he is, uh, he's in the top 10 of one of the songs on Expert. Wow. Yeah. It's the 90 degree. It's the 90 degree oh, okay. uh, legend on Expert. I think he's in the top 10. Um, but uh, he finished an Expert Plus and he came out of his room sweating and said, Dad, I did it. I did it. So, yeah. Just, just <laughs> finishing an Expert Plus level. Oh, you God. Feel like you're, you've, you've, you feel like, uh, no. yeah. If I make it through a hard, I'm happy with myself. Yeah. Holoception. Is the name of the game. Okay, cool. Holoception. Worth checking out. It's kind of like Aperture Lab type graphics. It's pretty polished for what it is. Uh, and, you know, it's like a physics simulator. So you can beat up these enemies and kind of throw them up in the air, slow time down. Um, I, I, I do believe that third person action can be really fun in VR. Yeah. I just want to see an implementation that, you know, solves a little ton of these uh, small problems. We all, I, we want to see more experiments. And yeah. it sounds like we got to see one. Yeah, so absolutely. Good on them. Yeah. Continue working on it. Cool. Um, I think that does it for this week then, because I know you have to go. Yep. We have an outro this week, Jeremy? We do. Uh, yeah. Forgive me if we played this before. This is from a little bit ago. It's hey, from... Uh, can I plug my podcast? I'm so sorry. Yes, it's do okay. it. Do it. Hey, uh, I started a new show a couple months ago. It's a single topic tech podcast where we talk about one thing every week. If you like to learn about one thing, a lot about one thing. I do it with Brad Shoemaker, who you may know from such sites as Giant Bomb. Charismatic um, guy. Very lovely man. Uh, one of my one of my dear, dear people. Um, but yeah, you can find it at techpod.content.town. And yeah, if you listen to it, I would love to hear what you think. How long is your show? It's usually about 45 minutes. Very reasonable. Yeah. We like to try to keep it in one commute. Yeah. You learn something you, from, you, from working mean, on this you'll, one. You'll learn something. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, I said you learn something. Yeah, I don't want to do any more three-hour podcasts. <laughs> no, thank All you. Right. This is um, uh, Can't Touch the Bead. Have we played that? I don't think so. All right. Oh, wait, no, we have. Oh, really? But let's play it again. Why? Because I'm sure it's a good one. Why? Uh, oh, you know what? I'm on... This always happens when I'm doing the airplay thing. <sighs> I got You're on the TV. Got to go to Roadcaster. Right, here we go. Here we go. Here <laughs> The experience is is limited, and you obviously can't touch because the laser would just basically burn your hand if you tried to um, get in into that position. We do want to be able to touch the bead, all within the confines of this cavity. Yeah, of course, it's a small space. Yeah, it's not a. a you, we can't get Tupac out there, and, <laughs> but it's uh, it's not bad. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. All right, they're uh, not impressed. No. Can't touch the bead. Can't yeah. touch the bead. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, 
Jeremy, let's give him a bonus one. Play that Will one from CES. I <laughs> do like I'm organized. Or Come something? on, Jeremy. <laughs> do it. Do it. The hey Will Siri, one. play the play the Will one from CES. What is that? Oh, go away, Siri. It's, it's like the second to last one. It is. It's the second to the newest one. Is it forks when you're eating too fast? I think that is might that be. Is, that it. sounds like it. That was the year <laughs> that stupid fork came out. <laughs> Hi there, I didn't see you. <laughs> Hey, let's start the show. It's January 10th, 2013. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. I'm Will Smith. Well, Norman and Joey are still at CES, and Gary's out sick. So I'm just going to do something a little unusual today. I'm here today to tell you guys, all by myself, for the next, you know, however long this takes, the truth about what I really think about CES. TV movies. No one is talking about 3D anymore. No one is talking about 3D anymore. No one is talking about 3D anymore. No one. TV movies. It's only comfortable watching 3D in the theaters, or, you know, even better, not at all. Good riddance, 3D, I bid you adieu. Smart TVs, on the other hand, don't seem to be going anywhere. Okay, let's start the show. TV, Hello, TV, Windows, Hello, TV, Windows, Hello, TV, Two Android 3.0 demos that were really just video loops. All the way down to ports to tell you when you're eating too fast. Ports to when you're eating too fast. Ports to when you're eating too fast. No one is talking about 3D anymore. No one is talking about 3D anymore. No one is talking about 3D anymore. No one. No one. No one. No one. No one. No one. Seven years later, still true. Well, except there's VR now. There but, was <laughs> VR then, wasn't there? Barely. Barely. But yeah. no one is talking, <laughs> talking about, about 3D, 3D anymore. anymore. It's definitely true. <laughs> All right. See you next week. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks for having me.